Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Ron Walsworth uh, for today's colloquium. Hi. Uh, hi. Ron graduated from Duke uh, back in 1984 with a BS, uh, PhD from Harvard in 91, uh, PhD thesis uh, under Ike Silvera. Uh, then went to the postdoc uh, CFA, 91 to 93, and he joined uh, uh, as the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory uh, in uh, 1993, where he's been ever since. And in, in 2003, he also uh, became a member of the Harvard Physics Department. Uh, Ron has been, Ron's work uh, is broad and, and uh, has, has uh, touched many fields. Uh, and most recently, uh, in the past decade, it's been characterized by a, a set of, of beautiful experiments exploring uh, the uh, kind of remarkable sensing properties of uh, MV uh, diamond uh, defects. And so that's what we're going to hear about today. Uh, yes, thank you. He also you, Mark. was recognized in uh, 2005 with the Pipkin Award for precision measurement. Ron, welcome to. Thank you very much. So at Harvard, we have a similar kind of room where we have the colloquium, similar, and there's the doors in the back. And the, when I was a grad student there, we'd sit in the back, the students, just like today. And we used to call those seats in the back the Rydberg seats. <laughs> and we hoped not to, be, not to be ionized out the back by a boredom fluctuation. So I'm going <laughs> to try not to bore you. This is a kind of applied physics talk, OK? It's about applications. So my group develops precision measurement tools using AMO techniques, which in today's world we call quantum, because there's a kind of hype bubble around quantum. And then we try to build bridges working with application specialists into many other fields across the physical and life sciences. And of course, today's talk is talking about defects in diamond, point defects in diamond. So what is this lovely picture here? See this? It's little bits of diamond. It's a bunch of diamond grit, sort of typical 10 micron size bits of diamond put under a UV lamp. And look at all the lovely colors that glow, because there are many defects in diamond and in other high band gap semiconductors, which will give off light when illuminated. Uh, different defects give different colors, depending upon the, you know, one of these little diamonds might have many defects in it. It might have more band A defects that give off blue, or more NV centers, these nitrogen vacancy color centers, which give off red. And that's the, what I'm going to concentrate on today, is this particular defect, the NV center. But remember that there are many other than the NV, and uh, we'll talk maybe just a briefly about it at the end. You can ask questions if you'd like. There are special properties that the NV has. It's an optically probed sensor of things like magnetic fields, electric fields, strain within the diamond crystal, temperature. I'll try to explain that to you a little bit, and then some of the things we can do with it, and some of the limitations as well. So here's a chunk of diamond, a macroscopic chunk of diamond, the kind of diamond you grow in the laboratory. And it's being illuminated with a green laser, and it's glowing pink because it's giving off red photons, a lot of red photons. So that's basically what you do. You hit this diamond with green light, and you measure the intensity of the red light. A little bit more than that, but that's basically, that's the measurable. What is the intensity of the red light that you're getting out? The NV, what is it? In this carbon lattice inside of diamond, it's two neighboring carbon atoms that are replaced by a nitrogen atom and a missing carbon atom or a vacancy. All right, they're, they're common in naturally occurring diamonds, and you can fabricate uh, diamonds having the NV density that you want in various ways we could talk about. But localized around this NV, this atomic scale defect, is an electron cloud which has some nice properties. It has this optical property of absorbing green light and emitting red. It also has electronic and nuclear spin. So electronic spin S equal one if it's the negatively charged NV center, which is the one of interest. It's energetically favorable for it to be the NV minus rather than the NV zero, although both exist typically, complicating things. But it's the NV minus that has the interesting properties I'm going to tell you about. This is a simplified version of the energy level diagram, which describes some of the key NV properties. Okay, so you see ground electronic levels. I'm pulling out the green laser pointer. Ground electronic levels, excited electronic levels. S equal one, electronic spin S equal one. M S equal zero and M S equal plus and minus one levels, of course. You can absorb green and emit red. So what, what are the key properties? They can be summarized by this simplified Hamiltonian here, in which there's a zero field splitting between the M S equals zero and M S equal plus and minus one levels. 
set by interactions. You can think of it loosely as dipole, magnetic dipole, dipole interactions between the two electrons, which kind of make up the NV, this electronic cloud. That gives you about a three gigahertz splitting, 2.87 gigahertz splitting. Then you, it has an electric dipole moment, which can couple to electric fields and strain. That will shift that zero field splitting. That 2.87 gigahertz splitting will shift with applied electric fields and strain uh, and, and temperature as well. And then there's a Bohr magneton scale magnetic moment. And so the MS equal plus and minus one levels will differentially shift with applied magnetic fields. And because it's a Bohr magneton, that's a pr pretty rapid three megahertz per Gauss shift in the energy levels. And then doing spectroscopy, optically detected spectroscopy of the spin transitions there is the key for just measuring out what things like the magnetic fields are. So a key factor, we're talking about these defects in room temperature diamond, is that it sits between the valence and conduction bands in diamond energetically and is largely decoupled from the lattice and can have relatively weak spin orbit coupling and can have a long electronic spin coherence time, which for the very best NVs can get as long as about um, a millisecond at room temperature. All right, so rapid changing of energy levels with things like electric fields and magnetic fields and temperature, long spin coherence time. And optical preparation and readout of the spin state. Again, absorb green, emit red, but there are differences between the MS equals zero level and the plus and minus one levels. The MS equals zero level to leading order will just absorb green and very rapidly on the order of 10 nanoseconds fluoresce back down to MS equals zero without its spin state changing. Okay? Whereas the plus or minus one levels will absorb green and emit back down to plus or minus one where they came from with a roughly 50% probability, but about a 50% probability to decay in a non-radiative, non-spin preserving way over a longer time scale, several hundred nanoseconds, to the MS equals zero level. So differences between the MS equals zero, kind of just a cycling transition, and the plus or minus ones, which can also go through the slow non-radiative decay. So what does that mean? That means if you look at a typical, nice typical, means very nice data, from a single NV averaged over many shots or an ensemble of NVs, and you said, what is the emission of the red photons as a function of time, nanoseconds, depending upon the spin state, zero or one, you'd see this typical behavior. If you're an MS equals zero, you turn on your laser, up shoots the fluorescence, you get a steady state equilibration, you reach a kind of steady state fluorescence le level where you're staying in the MS equals zero, you're cycling. In the plus or minus one levels, the green light goes on, it would start to rise up, ah, but now there's a deficit here, why? Because you get up, caught up in this, uh, this metastable singlet state and you are not radiating during this period of time and eventually you decay back down to MS equals zero and once that happens, now you've joined the, the MS equals zero state family of just absorbing green and emitting red. So you reach the same steady state uh, fluorescence rate. So, this means two key things. Turn on a green laser, it doesn't really matter which spin state you started in. If you wait several hundred nanoseconds, you're gonna get the same fluorescence rate. You're gonna initialize, and you're gonna initialize it in MS equals zero. But in this transient period here, shown here, there will be a different average fluorescence rate between the MS equal zero or the plus and minus ones, which allow you to distinguish them. So two key features, one you can initialize, and two you can distinguish between the spin states. So for example, you could do something like this. And this shows data again from a single NV kind of typical nice data, in which you, we have a f magnetic field, a static field, aligned along the NV axis of about 100 Gauss, and we're illuminating with the green laser, and we're ready, uh, measuring the intensity, the number of photons uh, per second that we're collecting that's coming out from this NV, right? And you can see that if you illuminate with microwaves that are near resonant, and the microwaves are off resonant somewhere in here, so you're trying to drive between zero and plus one, but you're off resonance, what happens? You pump into the MS equals zero level and you just get this steady state rate of red photons coming out. But if you go on to either the plus one or minus one transitions from zero, you will have a competition between the microwaves attempting to change the spin state, reducing the fluorescence rate, and the green light attempting to optically pump you back into high fluorescence rate. And so you will get a reduction in the intensity, a sharp reduction in the intensity, which can be your measure of what the magnetic field is or your microwave frequency. And right on the shoulder of this transition, you have, in some sense, a good magnetometer. Small changes in the field would shift the positions of these lines, and you could see a change in the red fluorescence rate, and that could give you information about magnetic field. So to make a better magnetometer, what would you want? You want the SNR to be as good as possible. So you want this uh, overall signal level to be large. 
You want the contrast between the m is equal to zero and plus one or minus one levels to be as good as possible. So you want this depth of this to be as deep as possible. And of course, you'd like the coherence times as long as possible so that this width of this transition is narrow and you have a very sharp change in fluorescence rate with things like magnetic field. And so a lot of the work in the field, which I'm not going to be talking about, goes into things like that. Getting better SNR, improving the overall optical output and collection, making the contrast better, improving the coherence times so that you can have a magnetic field sensor, which is better. Or if you want an electric field sensor or a temperature sensor, the overall lines, they wouldn't differentially split, they'd move relative to zero, but the same kind of issues would come up. All right. So that's kind of the level of discussion of the actual physics of the NV or my reporting to you, because I haven't really told you about the physics of the NV. I've just reported to you that I'm going to do. And now I'm going to transition to talking about applications uh, with this technology. You can make diamonds and fabricate diamonds which have high density ensembles of NVs, like this macroscopic chip shown here, which is infused at densities maybe 10 to the 18 per cubic centimeter. You can have nano diamonds. This is, those red dots are, of course, just stuck in with, by PowerPoint by me. But you can have nanodiamonds, which can have one NV or a few NVs in them. You can make nanostructures, like this scanning atomic force microscope, in which a diamond nanopillar can have a single NV, just a few nanometers from the surface, and you can scan over a surface and measure the local magnetic fields, etc. And many other geometries that I'll tell you about, and, and modalities of measurement. Okay, great. So what is useful about this diamond quantum sensing? It's, perhaps you can already tell because it's an atomic scale defect, it's this combo of high spatial resolution, good sensitivity, and if you have many NVs across a large diamond, wide field of view. So here's a simplistic plot which shows you typical performance in magnetic field sensitivity, or better sensitivity getting it going in this direction, versus spatial resolution, kind of given by the size of your detector better resolution going in this direction, comparing things like diamond, this NV diamond sensing technology, to other <coughs> state-of-the-art uh, magnetic sensing technologies. There are others, but this is an example. And you'll see that in this regime of high spatial resolution and good sensitivity, diamond ex excels. And you might ask questions like, well, why are they all kind of getting worse as we get to, to or excuse me, better as you get to coarser spatial resolution? The answer, of course, is pretty obvious. In something like the atomic vapor cells, as you get a bigger vapor cell, you can have more atoms in there, giving you better SNR. Same thing with diamond, with more NVs inside of a larger and larger diamond or a region inside of diamond. A squid, of course, as you make a flux detector, as you make a larger or smaller uh, loop with a squid, you'll get uh, better or worse magnetic field sensitivity. So this, this tends to be this general trend. But in this micron, submillimeter, micron, nanoscale region, the NVs are quite good. And you'll see these little colored dots with various things written next to them, like single proton, et cetera. That shows you the typical magnetic field magnitude that would be created by those signal sources if you had the standoff distance between your sensor and that signal source, like the NMR signal from one proton or one protein or something like that. And so you can see that those dots happen to fall in the nice oval, PowerPoint oval I plopped on this slide. And it turns out that all those sorts of signal sources have been seen in the last few years using this technology. A key thing, very key, you probably also realize already, is this proximity to target. The NV is an atomic scale sensor. It's in a robust solid state host. You can make the NV be just a few nanometers away from the surface and bring it into close proximity to a signal source. Why does that matter? With many state-of-the-art magnetometers, like the wonderful atomic vapor cells, one of their challenges in, when they're in this femtotesla or sub-femtotesla regime is the background ambient signals that are in your, your environment are such that they can swamp the signal of interest with a coarse centimeter or millimeter scale sensor. So you place them in magnetic shields. That's okay, except that greatly restricts the application space. When you bring your sensor really close to the signal source, this, now you can, don't need shielding often. You can make the signal large by proximity. And with that, it opens up the application space and can simplify a lot of the apparatus, as I will show you. These defects in diamond have other nice features. They can operate over a wide range of frequencies for the signal sources. They can have very good spectral resolution for NMR detection. I've already mentioned the op optical preparation and detection. 
I haven't mentioned yet, but it's pretty obvious that diamond has four crystalline axes and the NVs can be grown along all four axes or you can choose to have one or two, etc. But if you use all four axes, you can have the projection of the, let's say, magnetic field of interest along four axes and you can distinguish them spectroscopically and you just have a sort of built-in vector magnetometer. It operates in a wide range of conditions, well above room temperature, well below, high pressures and mild radiation under a wide range of conditions. You can put diamond in contact with biological systems, no problem. So to greatly, this sort of simple, widely applicable modality of using this robust solid opens up a lot of applications. Okay, oops. Now a few highlights, things just selected from the various Harvard groups. There are many other groups around the world over the last few years. In biology, physical sciences, some being commercialized. I'm going to pick a few of these and tell you about them and try to emphasize certain cases where I think the technology has already started to translate successfully into other fields and others where it's got a long way to go and may not be successful and what the challenges are. Just at Harvard, there are many groups using this technology in one way or another and that's just one university, of course. The folks on the top row here were involved in the original conceptualization and development of the technology, development of it. Folks down here are people involved currently in various applications. If you go back about 12 years ago when this was first being conceptualized, and this is a photo, take a photo of the grad students and postdocs who, this was taken I think in 2008, uh, of the people who were working on the first demo experiments actually in John Doyle's lab, even though he wasn't involved in the actual experiment. He sort of lent us lab space because it was a pilot project between Amir Yacobi, Misha Lukens, and my group. These are the folks that were involved in that work there. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to tell you where they are now. Because, you know, with university training people is the most important thing that we do. All right, here is an example of a widely used modality and its relative simplicity. We call the QDM, or the quantum diamond microscope. You can get a sense of scale. There's a computer monitor. It's a simple apparatus which sits on a tabletop. It consists of a diamond chip with a high density of NVs at the surface, like a microscope slide, a dense layer that you can choose in different diamonds, 100 nanometers, micron, 10 microns thick. You'll, you'll choose that NV density, a uh, dense layer to be uh, uh, at the, at kind of to be the thickness to be consistent with the XY spatial resolution that you'd like. You typically illuminate in a kind of turf mode with the green light to keep it out of the sample. The red fluorescence then comes and is collected with optics into a camera and you take a two dimensional image along with microwaves to manipulate the spins of the magnetic field patterns in your sample of interest. This shows you a side view. There's the NV layer. The diamond might be several millimeters in diameter. This might be, let's say, a micron thick layer. It might be half a millimeter or so thick. And you put it in contact with a sample of interest, for example, which has signal sources that you want to image. Two-dimensional pattern. This shows you a nice photo of one of the setups zooming in. Okay, here's a kind of unexpected application that came from talking and one of the most successful ones so far in terms of translation and talking to experts in other fields. It's in applying this technology to small magnetic signatures that are in ancient earth rocks and meteorites. Wonderful people like my Indiana Jones-like collaborator Roger Fu here go into exotic locations and discover and dig up ancient rocks because these are, can be at times recorders of what was going on back at those times. The, they, some of these rocks will have small bits and pieces in them which the isotopic evidence and the chemical evidence indicates have been relatively unaltered since the high curie point iron bearing grains inside of these rocks went through their curie point. So they can be recorders of magnetic fields like the early Earth's geodynamo or in the case of meteorites which have fallen to Earth inside of the burned out outer part of the meteorite can be cool interiors which can record uh, what the magnetic fields were even before the planets formed in certain cases, believe it or not. These kind of microscopes are now operational in laboratories that the, these earth scientists are using. Here's an example. This is an overlay of a two-dimensional magnetic field image made with the QDM and an optical image of a thin slice of ancient earth rock. When I say ancient earth rock, really the thing that's ancient, that's more than 4 billion years old, is this zircon inside here. The other material is much younger. Distinguishing the magnetic fields and the magnetization inside the materials inside that zircon from these other materials while not altering the rock in other ways is the key challenge, and the challenge that this QDM answers, which other technologies could not. For example, squids could be used to look at this kind of rock. 
However, you do not want the rock temperature changed. So you need a standoff distance with a squid that is such that would be too coarse to be able to resolve the zircon from the other secondary materials which are not of interest. So it's this ability to have the high spatial resolution together with the wide field of view to be able to find the things of interest that are key for answering the scientific problems in this field. Such that now, we have NSF support together with the Earth scientists to build a bunch of these QDMs and disseminate them around the country. The first four are going out the door and more are being manufactured now. This is the sort of thing we got actually NSF support in a non-peer reviewed way from multiple parts of the NSF. Why? Because the program managers there realized that this technology was going to be so transformative to this community and it, there wasn't a program that would actually, a peer reviewed program that would actually allow this to happen and so they provide us with resources for the, uh, the, the kind of AMO people to work with the earth scientists to build these instruments and disseminate. The same sort of technology we're now looking at the activity inside of integrated circuits, which the security community is interested in. Not yet ready to show data from that, but it looks very promising to be able to look at patterns of static magnetic fields, temperature, and microwave magnetic fields across chips, and then use uh, uh, neural network techniques to be able to correlate that with activity. The same basic modality, this macroscopic diamond chip with a high density of envies at the surface, that is this two-dimensional magnetic field microscope, forms the basis of a startup company, QDTI, which I'm one of the co-founders, so I have a financial interest in. It's a, magnetic di it's a, a medical diagnostics company. So again, here's the diamond slide. Imagine this dense envy layer near the surface. You take a sample, like a blood sample. There's a patented technology which, uh, which can identify and label biomarkers of interest with magnetic nanoparticles in a way that only when the labeling happens does it give off the distinct magnetic signature. And then you can do things like this. Let's say you took a blood sample and spiked one of these bad actors, one of these cells, a circulating tumor cell or some sort of other th that thing in there. And it has the magnetic uh, nanoparticles labeled on it. If you try to image through the dense blood, you can't see the cell. It turns out it's there. But the magnetic fields move largely unperturbed through the blood sample into the diamond, into the NV layer, not hard at all to see and to quickly see that magnetic signature. You can scale up and have, see over wide field of view, get many of these cells and identify them and count them with great efficiency and fidelity. So in fact, our metrics look quite good compared to other technologies. We have boxes already built which are out at strategic partners being tested and we will see in the next coming years whether this is a successful translation of technology to be determined. But things are looking good so far. Alright, so before the talk began we were futzing around trying to make this thing work which was supposed to show you a cool website about another application and we couldn't make it work. So instead we'll do it the old-fashioned way and we'll go directly to the website. What is this? This is Lockheed Martin's website. So at Lockheed Martin, they want to tell you about three technologies that are going to make you say, wow. I don't know if they're going to make you say, wow, but that's what they say. And they have cool things about the future fleet. Isn't that nice? And then you keep going, and they talk about quantum navigation. So what do they mean here? They mean NV diamond magnetometers. Here's an example with the casing off of one they built in which it's a vector magnetometer about this big that they have built and taken out onto drones, submarines, planes, etc. to do GPS denied navigation by magnetic field anomalies in the Earth. Right? They tell me it's working well. I'm not sure, but at least they put it on their website. doing with them is a collaboration on the scientific aspects of things. It's been going on for the last few years. In particular, we do things like this. We take advantage of the four crystalline axes, the four crystalline axes within diamond and the fact that the NVs lie along all of them to be able to measure the projections of the magnetic field along those axes simultaneously and do vector magnetometry. That's the kind of key advantage non-drifting vector magnetometry over long periods of time that don't need recalibration that Lockheed Martin wants for these autonomous uh, navigation of vehicles. This is work that grad students Jenny Schloss, Matthew Turner, and postdoc John Barry uh, performed. Now John is leading the NV Diamond Magnetometry Group that's at MIT Lincoln Lab. Okay, so those are some examples of translations into other fields and practical applications that are starting to pay off. Now let's talk about some work in progress and maybe some basic science applications. 
and uh, like this vector magnetometry thing. Another era we're applying it to, which still has a long way to go, and I'm not sure whether it really will be scientifically successful, is in doing magnetic detection, non-invasive magnetic detection of action potentials from neurons with signal neuron sensitivity. So a couple years ago, we were able to use a very similar device to what we had in that demo for Lockheed Martin with about 15 picotesla per root hertz broadband, which means a, down to like 10 kilohertz rep rate uh, magnetometry, and we could measure the action potential from, a, from an individual neuron being made to fire, it's a giant axon, in a live, whole, undissected marine worm. So there's the marine worm, the diamond's underneath it, you have the turf mode of illumination with the light, the red fluorescence is being collected. It's kind of like the QDM, but in some sense more sensitive, but also cruder because it's a single pixel measurement. It's the same crew of people working on this project and also on the vector magnetometry for Lockheed Martin. And a key thing where I mentioned the vector magnetometry is, as many of you may know, how do I think about an action potential in a neuron? Well, it's a bipolar electrical current that flows, if the neuron's going this way, which flows this way, and then this way. An ohmic current that flows this way, and then this way. Associated with that is an azimuthal magnetic field that goes like this, and then later an azimuthal magnetic field that goes like this in time. If you have vector magnetometry, you can tell the difference between an action potential going this way, going boom, boom, and one that's going this way, going boom, boom, because the order in which you would see the azimuthal fields you know, would be different, would be opposite. If you just have a scalar sensor, you won't be able to detect that. But that's the sort of thing we could do here. We could purposely reverse which direction the action potential was firing and be able to see that we saw the pulse go up down as opposed to down up. All right, that's very nice. You may also notice that the down up has a higher amplitude than the, the up down than the down up. This one is bigger than that one. And that's because of differences in the propagation speed of the action potential. So, properly calibrated, we have a tool that can tell directionality of propagation and speed of propagation. That's exciting and hard to do with other technologies and I think impossible to do with other technologies non-invasively. However, what we've done so far is a single neuron, big, giant axon, and a super robust invertebrate. That's not very useful for neuroscience, it's a demo. So we have a long way to go. It's also a single pixel measurement, meaning we're not imaging. We're just averaging over the entire volume of those NVs to get the sensitivity we need to be able to see these weak magnetic fields from the neuron. So we've got a long way to go to get to what we want to be able to do, which is networks, functional networks of neurons and being able to image them real time, ultimately. We're working on that. This is the kind of fabricated wire phantom. Before we get to the biology again, let's see if we can do imaging. Imaging these sorts of fields, and we're going to make a fabricated phantom that isn't exactly a neuron, and is, we'll be able to run larger currents than you would get from the neuron to begin with. But we'll give it some sort of cool shape that'll evoke biology, so we do that sort of thing there. <laughs> and in fact, we can image this sort of thing there. All right? But notice, so that's fine. This gives us wide field of view, fast, 20 hertz, that's not very fast. Uh, action potential happens in a millisecond. So though that's progress, we're still not where we want to be. We've done 2D imaging, we need a better sensitivity, we need things faster, and we need to be able to do this biologically in an interesting way. So I'd say all this is kind of cute, but not yet solving scientific problems, unlike in the, earth, the ancient earth rocks and, and meteorites, we're not actually solving frontier scientific problems. These are unrealistic signals, they're not biological. These, this bridge that I'm talking about is far from built. Next, we're actually doing more robust than neurons, cardiac cells, which are also electrically active, and then eventually back to the neurons as the technology develops. So that's a snapshot of an application which I'm excited about, but it has a long way to go. Here's another one that I'm excited about and also has a long way to go. It's using NVs for NMR of single proteins and eventually of individual cells. So back in, again, a couple of years ago, these fellows, Igor Levchinsky and Alex Sushkov, Alex is now a faculty member at BU, working with Hongkong Park, Misha Lukin and myself, were able to use very shallow NVs, a few nanometers below the surface, to be able to measure for the first time the NMR signal from an individual protein it was a simple protein tethered on the surface, isotopically altered so that you can see an NMR signal which is distinct from kind of ubiquitous background proton signal. And we're able to see the NMR 
spectrum just barely and see that it scales as the way you'd expect with applied magnetic field. A key to seeing this sort of measurement, which took hours of signal averaging, was that you had a 10x SNR boost using quantum logic. So get ready, here's the one time in this talk when I'm actually, the use of the word quantum in these sensors actually kind of makes sense in the modern way, meaning there's going to be t entanglement involved here. Before everything is basically semi-classical, what I've been telling you, all right? So what we do is use this little two qubit uh, quantum machine to get this 10x SNR boost involving the electron spin, electronic spin of the ND as the sensor because its energy levels shift rapidly with magnetic fields, the NMR signal from the protein, and the nuclear spin inside of the N in the NV as a memory, which has a long T1 time. Here's the little experimental protocol. The NV, the electronic spin, measures this protein NMR signal. It measures it by using this protocol here. You take a pi over two, you create, you, you use your green light goes on into this MS equals zero uh, state as I told you at the beginning. Then you apply a pi over two pulse with the microwaves. And then you synchronize a series of pi pulses with what you expect the NMR signal to be. Because you have positive and negative lobes of the NMR signal. And if you didn't apply those pi pulses, they would cause the phase of the NV to accumulate and go back and forth and not accumulate in that phase. But if you apply this train of pi pulses appropriately, you flunk, then you get accumulate more phase, accumulate more phase, accumulate more phase, and build up net phase. Right? A net accumulation if there is a uh, signal at that frequency given by the rate of the pi pulses. It creates a narrow band sensor for AC magnetic fields. So that is just regular old NVNMR that a lot of groups had done before. Then you use a swap gate that takes advantage of the fact that depending upon the uh, uh, nuclear spin state and the electronic spin state, resonant microwaves and RF will, will cause the electronic spin or the nuclear spin to flip or not flip dependent upon the state of the other one. And this allows you to take whatever phase has been measured in the electron and push it into the nuclear spin. Now you've stored it in a place that will last a lot longer. But the nuclear spin is not a good place to read out. It's a good place to store but not read out. So then you use a C naught gate which entangles the electronic spin of the NV and the nuclear spin. Oh, wait a second, why do you do that? Wait, wait. We had the phase measured here and then you put it in the electronic spin, then I put it in the nuclear spin. Now I'm putting it back in the electronic spin. Why? Why am I doing this? I'm doing this in a way that not only puts this information back in the electronic spin, but entangles it with the nuclear spin so that when you read out and measure and read out and collect your red photons, <coughs> you project, but whatever that information is that's in the nuclear spin is not destroyed and you can re-entangle and re-correlate and now repeat the measurement protocol and instead of getting at most one red photon out for a single NV on one run of the measurement, you can get many red photons out. Right? That's where the SNR boost comes. Does that give you, is there a free lunch here? Does that give you uh, state tomography in one run of the experiment? No, because you projected, you got, let's say, some mixed state or coherent state, you know, some N NV MS equals zero and MS equals plus one, you're still going to have to repeat the measurement multiple times to be able to understand what the f net phase was, but each time you make the measurement, you can get up to a hundred times more photons out because of the, of the ability of the nuclear spin to have a, mu it has a much longer lifetime and it can uh, hold that information much longer. So this little simple two qubit quantum information machine can, because of the, the tailoring of the electronic spin for measurement and the nuclear spin for memory, can give you a 10x SNR boost, which is key for taking this single protein measurement from, to make it possible. So now just several hours of signal averaging rather than several hundred hours, because you need 10x squared, several hundred hours of signal averaging, which would be completely impossible. The experiment, this protein would denature, things would get messed up. Right? So my own opinion is that in sensing, quantum sensing, the earliest places in which, some of the earliest places in which you're going to see quantum advantage is this sort of thing. Simple little quantum machines that might use two qubits, etc., which take advantage of the special properties of electronic spins, nuclear spins, photons, etc., depending upon what, you, what your task is. Okay, great. We measured the NMR signal from a single protein. Isn't that great? But we didn't do anything useful, really, because look at the, look at that, 25 kilohertz, six kilohertz, 
Those are ridiculously broad spectral lines. Not useful. Why are they so broad? You know, NMR lines, you typically need Hertz spectral resolution to do useful chemical analysis. Why are they so broad? Two reasons. One, the sensor itself, the NV, is limited by its decoherence time and its spin and relaxation time to a kind of millisecond or a little bit better if you use correlation spectroscopy, several milliseconds with T1. So you might do at best 100 hertz spectral resolution in the traditional way that the sensor is operated. 100 hertz is more than 1 hertz. So the sensor itself is not able to do the spectral resolution you need for chemical analysis. And at the nanoscale, there's a second problem. There's statistical polarization fluctuations, there's diffusion, there could be effects of tethering to the surface, back action of the NV on the signal, uh, on the sample, excuse me. And so you have various things, there's the statistical polarization fluctuations, which means the sample's spectral lines are broadened. Useful NMR spectroscopy typically require Hertz resolution. Typical J couplings, effective nuclear spin spin couplings mediated by electrons, are going to be, you want Hertz spectral resolution if you want to do useful chemical analysis. Chemical shifts depend upon the applied magnetic field, but they can also sometimes be small, depending on how you're doing things. So, how do we solve this problem? We solved it, kind of by backing away from the nanoscale to the micron scale and using a very simple but very effective new measurement protocol developed by Dominic Bucher and David Glenn in my group. So, we saw problem one. What was problem one? That's this, you know, this uh, finite lifetime of the NV limits you to kind of 100 hertz spectral resolution and we need hertz spectral resolution. Well, that's true only if you assume every time you make a measurement is independent of every other time you take a measurement and you have no knowledge of what's going on. But of course, if the signal source is phase coherent, if it is over second time scales, you can synchronize one measurement to the next measurement to the next measurement with an external clock and do a phase coherent measurement over arbitrarily long periods of time only, only, only limited by your, by your clock. Very easy tweak to the, the measurement protocol and we could get sub millihertz spectral resolution. You've got to wait more than a thousand seconds if that's what you want. But if you need hertz resolution, just make a measurement over a second. Each individual measurement might, might be a millisecond, but you're synchronizing them one to the next with a clock. Tiny little dead times are miss, and missing there while you read out with the green laser and all that stuff. But it works quite well. And the second thing is operate at the micron scale. So all these statistical polarizations and the diffusion, though they still exist, are not limiting you. Diffusion is still occurring, but the time to diffuse 10 microns is orders of magnitude longer than to diffuse a few nanometers. The statistical polarizations in that ensemble do not dominate over the thermal polarization, etc. So you can do more traditional NMR, like NMR, on picoliter scale samples. Now with an ensemble of NVs, where you're setting the depth of the NVs to be approximately the size of the the sample of interest, which is like the volume of an individual cell. Existing NMR microcoils can't do that length scale. With that, it works quite well. You can take tiny little picoliter samples and measure nice NMR spectra with Hertz resolution and see chemical shifts, see J couplings. And it's consistent with literature values. So we're finding NMR spectra in very, you know, these are the simplest things you could put on the diamond as a, as a first demo that, are, com that are, are complex in that they have more than one peak. Now, two peaks. We've done things with a few peaks. But it's nice, simple demos. That's cool, but are also not yet solving scientific problems. Those things like the xylene, that's 100% concentration. How many people care about the NMR spectrum of 100% concentration of xylene? No one. We need to be able to get much better SNR so that we can get down to millimolar or micromolar concentrations. And we need to be able to uh, uh, do this in, in biologically or chemically interesting systems. But we've got some recent promising results. We combine this NVNMR with hyperpolarization techniques, particularly Overhauser-based dynamic nuclear polarization, a very standard technique in which we use a radical known as tempole and uh, we drive it before we do the NV measurement protocol with the synchronized readout protocol to get our Hertz, N Hertz resolution NV NMR, we can have a, 
uh, let's say 10 millimolar of temple, which is a typical kind of concentration that people already use in certain kinds of NMR experiments, at macroscopic NMR. You drive the electron spin transitions there and you saturate them. And now the detailed balance uh, uh, attempting to re-equilibrate things thermally transfers that spin polarization largely to the nuclear spins, which are in transient random uh, interactions with the electronic spins. From that sort of thing, you can get now the uh, nuclear spins can approach the, the polarization, the thermal polarization that the electron spins would have, and we can get spectra like that in pure water, where this is with this dynamic nuclear polarization. See that? It's much bigger than blue, and the blue has 10 to the 4 averages. So without hyperpolarization, you're getting, you're getting 200x lower SNR. So with the CERF technique, now we can do dilute samples, do NVNMR with high spectral resolution and dilute samples. And that's what we've done. This is what was in the Nature paper with 100% concentration. Now we can drop down, this is the number of limited detection in animals per root hertz, the sample volume from here to here. All these gray symbols show you the very world's best uh, microcoil NMR at high field. We're operating at low, kind of 100 millitesla type of fields. If you say, where is the volume of an individual cell? It's on this region here. And what are the typical concentration ranges of, of things of interest inside of a cell? It would be up here for just the water inside the cell, not of particular interest, and going down to here and below. So we've now reached femtomole number sensitivity, millimolar concentration sensitivity. We're making progress, but we want more than that. We need micromolar concentration sensitivity. And so we're working on that now. We're working on boosting the magnetic fields up to three Tesla, which will give us better chemical analysis ability and also higher thermal polarization. We're using additional hyperpolarization techniques like, like Sabre. Things are working well, which could give several orders of magnitude additional increased polarization. We're doing all this integration with microfluidics and the associated microwaves. We don't want to just do a single point detector. We want to do the spectroscopy across a wide field of view, imaging in multiple sites. We're incorporating, oops, excuse me, pulse field gradients to do diffusion measurements and imaging, K-space-based MRI imaging. And we're working to engineer up a compact, robust instrument like the QDMs for the rock work that eventually could sit on a tabletop and even eventually be smaller than that. So that's the dream to take the early stage work that we've done and engineer ultimately kind of chip scale devices. The Moore Foundation is providing us with some initial seed funding in that direction. What could the applications be? Here's a few. We're talking to people right now. Things like doing measuring metabolism inside of individual cells, being able to do diffusion based NMR measurements of the structure, the physical structures inside of single cells, particularly disease cells, which can inform people which are doing clinical human MRI to give you a, a kind of indirect super resolution imaging where now you're not actually spatially um, doing things in real space, you're doing it in K space to learn about what's going on inside of, of uh, disease tissue. Okay. I've gone through some of these sensing highlights. I'm going to transition now into the kind of concluding part of the talk mention a few more things. There's one area up here of all these like, uh, you know, things I'm talking about. There's a few, there's one in particular which has already had some nice impact in basic physics and I haven't talked about it at all and that's in condensed matter physics. So some examples just from Harvard, some published, some not. Skirmions and magnetic multilayers, spin torque oscillators and, and driven YIG, again uh, with ferromagnetic resonance and a magnetic insulator being able to measure the spin chemical potential. We're studying the viscous electron flow in graphene. A lot of this work here is led by Amir Jacobi, my colleague at Harvard, and so he'd be a great guy to invite for a colloquium and I'm sure he would be able to give a great talk on these, on these topics and more. In addition, there's some exotic ideas, kind of high risk ideas in directional detec detection of, of um, low mass WIMP dark matter that we're working on with Stanford alum, Sergeet Rajandran and others that I don't have time to tell you about now, although if people want to ask me a question, I can tell you about that kind of crazy idea of what we're working on there. On the left hand side are the applications in which, in my opinion, the current performance of the NVs is probably good enough to keep pushing things forward. And on the right are the kind of applications where we'd really need better sensors. You always want better sensors, but these guys over here could live with what we've got. So there's a DARPA program whose strange acronym is DRINKS. It means, you know, every time you see a Q, it means quantum somehow. They're running out of Q words and making new ones. And part of its goal is this. 
It's a basic physics program, but the application part of it is to tr move into a regime of very high density NVs. So the NVs are now so close together that their magnetic dipole-dipole interactions between them are starting to limit the coherence time. You know, you want to pack as many NVs into a volume as possible to boost your SNR. More red photons, you make more sense of measurements. But at some point, they interact with each other and they start limiting the coherence time. If you could get down to this regime here, things like the single cell NMR and MRI would become quite successful. The GPS denied navigation, despite Lockheed Martin putting it on its website, could use better bandwidth. So if you get better sensitivity, you can make the same magnetic field measurement in a faster time, i.e. higher bandwidth. And crazy, slightly scary things like human neural interfaces, arrays of sensors on the scalp might become possible. What we've done together with the diamond growing company is make <coughs> special diamonds, we call them purple diamonds, which have high densities of NVs, now about 10 nanometers apart. Not so high density that you get other weird strain problems, very uniform homogeneous uh, samples, which give us a lot of red light, and, but have this challenge of the interactions between the NVs limiting the coherence time. And as part of this drinks program, we're working on floquet techniques, sort of like these time crystal ideas, to see whether these can be better sensors. There's recent promising results. If I came back in six months or so, I'd be ready to tell you about them. These are things, this program is led by Norm Yao up at Berkeley. Okay, what about all those other defects? Remember this slide? There's lots of them. There's silicon vacancies, germanium vacancies, lead vacancies, many more. They're being explored and should be explored. Some have different complementary properties to NV. Some work well at low temperatures. Some are better sensors, you know, insensitive to strain within the crystal, but still good magnetic field sensors, things like that. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities there and there is uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. NVs are just the choice now. There's also vacancies, dye vacancies in other materials like silicon carbide that are very promising. But for the current applications, NV diamond is still the best. And so for the, until better defects are, are really optimized for the kind of applications that I've been telling you about here, this is the, uh, the, the sensor of choice, the defect of choice. All right, remember this slide? Where are they now? Okay, that's where they are across the world. Many of them, for example, Lynn Fom here is part of the NV Diamond uh, group with John Barry and others at, at Lincoln Lab and have gone across the world. Some of these faces the AMO community recognizes, but this is back in 2008. There's some nice stories. This is before, you might find this amusing. Uh, Misha Lukin was hired as a theorist and um, Harvard resisted giving him a lab for a while, so for a while he was having to kind of semi-camp out in offices and in, um, and in um, you know, taking like, you know, the, depending on the, the kindness of strangers, people like you know, our friends, people like John Doyle, myself, and others were giving some of his experiments lab space. This was happening down John Doyle's lab. I'm happy to take questions. These are the folks in my group, list of collaborators, support comes from many agencies. I hope you find this uh, not too boring and I didn't lose too many people out the back with the boredom fluctuations. Thank you very much. Um, so, it turns out there's often in these samples on the surface, there's a kind of nanometer or so layer of proton containing stuff, either bound water and or organics, can create a large background. background. So it's background discrimination. That is another challenge. How to get, even if you have wonderful sensor and you boost the SNR and everything, and you can solve the statistical polarization fluctuation problem or take advantage of it with polarizing them, you'd still have this background challenge. Yeah, it makes the micron scale, the single cell cell, single cell scale easier and still very, in my biased opinion, very impactful. So in a purple diamond, when you have this extremely high concentration, yeah. does that affect the stability uh, of these NV centers in the diamond? That's a very good question. The answer is yes, and other things can too. So there's a lot, this is a colloquium level talk, so there's a lot of things I've swept under the rug. One of the, or kind of half swept under the rug. I mentioned that this is the NV minus that has the S equal one electronic spin. The NV zero, which has S equal one half and does not have the nice uh, ODMR properties. You can't initialize the, the spins optically and you can't read them out optically. Uh, 
you can get, a, a, let's call it a kind of an analog to bleaching in which the, or, or ionization in which the NB minus can go to NB zero. And there are techniques also to convert the NB zero back to NB minus. So working to stabilize the charge states to just be what you want and even optimize the charge states is one of the ongoing challenges. And it can be particularly bad when you illuminate with very intense light or when you have things like hot, this high density. So many things, again, how do we grow the diamonds? How do we get the NVs where we want them? How, do we, how about other defects that happen to be within the diamond? Background nitrogen P1 centers that create magnetic field noise. Other defects which can lead to charge hopping. All this sort of stuff is ongoing. Yes, Roger. Yes. So, okay, WIMPs. Yes, lots of wonderful work has been done. Um, to go, uh, challenge here, this is a slightly out of date plot, an exclusion plot of the WIMP nucleon cross section versus WIMP mass. We're hoping to push down into this 10 and sub 10 uh, GeV, lower than 10 GeV region to get in, in here, to get uh, below the neutrino floor. What's the idea? I wrote. You know, you have at least two challenges. One, the small cross-section, of course, means you need large amounts of stuff. That's why they have large amounts of liquid xenon, large amounts of mass. The neutrino floor, as David Spurgel had, um, which is coherent neutrino scattering, David Spurgel had suggested back in the 80s, one way around that is to do directional detection because the neutrinos disproportionately, not exclusively, will come from the sun. And it, with a standard model of WIMP sources, you would be getting a so-called WIMP halo wind through the solar system moving through the galaxy. So if you could tell where the, wimp, the WIMPs versus neutrinos are coming from reliably, you could potentially distinguish these distributions from each other. Our idea is there are existing programs using uh, time um, projection chambers, but using gas. So they have directional ability, but not large mass, not large amounts of stuff. And of course, liquid xenon, et cetera, have large amounts of stuff, large mass, but don't have directional uh, d detection capability, one or the other. So our idea is to use diamond, of course, because this is a diamond talk, a large amount, like a cubic meter of diamond. Please, please. I told you it was crazy. <laughs> the, the problem is not the cost of the diamond, which people always think of. <laughs> Let me ask you, do you think when you go to buy a diamond ring or something like this, there's a reason why a hardworking young man like Giorgio here, if he sits, scrimps and saves, can uh, buy someone he, he likes a diamond, just barely with all your money, they, you can buy a diamond for somebody. Is that accidental? Or is it maybe tuned by a cartel to maximally extract? <laughs> it's the latter. The actual cost of making, you know, there's not just the diamonds dug out of the ground, but making diamonds in the laboratory is much less than you might think. That doesn't mean a cubic meter of diamond. I'm not talking about one giant cubic meter. I'm talking about a large amount of small diamonds whose net volume equals approximately a cubic meter. That doesn't mean that that's trivial in expense, but it wouldn't be the showstopper. It might be tens of millions of dollars for the material in a hundred or few hundred million dollar project. Okay, easy for these guys to pay for. The idea is you have many millimeter sections of diamond. Diamond is a good scintillation material. When there's a vent, an event with a neutrino or a wimp in one region, it will give off scintillation light. Maybe that's the method. Maybe you use the electrons to detect. You then localize to a, something like a millimeter scale section. Then you would use NVs or silicon vacancies, which are all a different one of the defects, to map the strain within the diamond and localize this defect and it would have a characteristic uh, shape and directionality. It would be asymmetric. That you can calculate. What would be an impulse of energy and momentum into a carbon nucleus, which would then be dislodged and rattled through other carbon nuclei? You can, I'll go forward. There's the purple diamonds again. Let me leap forward. Uh, okay, I didn't show you, but there's a, we have calculations which can, which show what this def, this strain track would be, like a 100 nanometer region, which would be, be corrupted. We've made progress in being able to map strain within diamonds. Um, we can do it with better sensitivity than you need to be able to find this defect. We've been able to do high, spectral res uh, high spatial resolution imaging and sensing of magnetic fields and probably can do strain too, down to 20 nanometers, which you would need. But we have got a long way to go to be able to really make this work. Can we really do three-dimensional? It's a giant needle in a haystack problem. We've got this tiny little strain defect in a large amount of material. Is that realistic? Perhaps we need other techniques. 
like, like uh, x-ray tomography, cathaluminescence, et cetera, to localize where the defect is. But that's the basic idea. So it leads a defect track with a particular direction, and you then be able, with timing, to know where neutrinos and WIMPs are coming from. That's the idea. OK? Oh, yes. Can you clear the defects? Can you clear them? Meaning? The tracks. Um, the <clears throat> right, right. So the tracks from dark matter or neutrinos would be stable unless you annealed the diamond to very high temperatures. And even then, that's such corruption of the lattice that it may not all go back exactly into, uh, without pressure, it might not, you can, high pressure and high temperature probably wouldn't go back into uh, the diamond the two FCC lattices, but possibly we can clear them. The idea would be probably to have many backup pieces. You know, you're not going to have, the event rate is not going to be so incredibly high. You'd have 10 or tens of events per year if you get rid of all the backgrounds, which is a huge job. That would be either WIMPs or neutrinos, and you'd want to then measure them, and probably while you're measuring one little small millimeter section, you'd insert another backup piece of diamond. Why detecting magnetic field is better than electric field for detection of neural activity? The magnetic field is two times smaller and the SNR is much weaker. Yes, that's right. That's a good question. I think uh, I don't have a super convincing answer for you, except we have good magnetic field sensors. The, the motivation for me was the two things. One, the non-invasiveness, less invasive, that the magnetic fields are, not, are um, minimally corrupted over millimeter scales. And the other is the complementary nature. We were measuring, I didn't show it here, but electric fields with conventional techniques along with magnetic fields because we're interested in doing a more biophysics, answering biophysics questions of what is the complex impedance within neurons and between neurons. So inject current, let the currents flow, measure what the potentials are and the magnetic fields, which will give you current information. And from that, try to improve upon the models, the simplistic models of uh, the complex impedances within neurons and between neurons. So it's a complementary technique. Yeah, hi. Um, super interesting um, talk. Uh, this is not a technical yeah. question per se, but I can see that your like work is going out in all these different trajectories to like different application yes. areas. And I'm wondering how like uh, where you feel like your role as like scientist, fundamental research um, scientist, like uh, relates to, you know, what the ultimate application in society of those things ends up being. <coughs> so I'm thinking specifically, you know, like with the um, denied GPS. Right. Um, Given that it's a military kind of industrial contractor, yeah. yeah, things like that. There's like clearly many different ways that could go. Um, I'm wondering, you know, where do you see that going to? And this right. is the general question, you know, for applied science, I guess. Yeah. So personally, my own personal scientific interests are driven by kind of almost bimodal or which is fundamental physics questions, some high energy and astrophysics questions and also fundamental condensed matter, but sort of basic physics questions, and then applications which are hopefully have legs and are going to actually solve problems either in other science fields like the rock work or in the real world, like some of the biomedical diagnostics. And I like being able to be a part of a group of people who can develop tools which can go in those two directions. Then nobody has a problem with curing diseases. But some of these, as you're implying, some of these applications get a little more uh, into gray areas. Um, I personally did not have a problem with helping Lockheed Martin in a approved way do the basic science that's helping GPS denied navigation because I think having, um, well, I don't want to get political here, but I think the, the insecurity of the GPS systems and the other systems other countries have is a kind of challenge that uh, it's in, in not just that, that we should overcome as a society. Yeah. But I agree, these are tough, tough questions. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Ron. You're welcome. Is that good? Okay. Yeah, it's a great talk. It's a cloak, right? So, a lot of details in there. Hey, Ken, how you doing?